chance on Thursdays there's a uh, Ron putting on a little concert on Facebook you should check it out he does a really good job well happy Mother's Day today we're honoring all of the ladies in our church there's a special gift for each one the table where's the table at okay and if you haven't got it it'll be open up after the service we just want to thank you for your support of the church through your, through your giving. You've been doing very well, and we're just very grateful for everything you've been doing. And I think that's about it. We're going to just pray. Lord, we thank you for being here with us. We just praise your holy name. We ask you just to watch over each and every one. We thank you for the mothers and for the love that they show. But we also right now, Lord, we want to pray for the women who... Mother's Day is kind of a hard time for them, and it's a, just a rough reminder. So we pray you just be with them, lift them up, Lord, and just we praise your holy name. And we thank you again for everything you do for us. Right now we just pray for a pastor, and be with him as he gives the message. We pray for the praise team, and with the song, we just pray, Lord, that you just use all of this together to just further your kingdom. And we just thank you again, and amen. Thank you, Tim. We certainly can't sit still on the first song as we worship. Are you ready to worship and praise this morning, church yes. family? Yes. Let's stand together as we sing. I thank God. Yes. We welcome you on this Mother's Day. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide in this weary soul With bag bones I try with all my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A bag And just when I ran out the road Man, a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. You picked me up, you turned me around, you 
Place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank God. I cannot deny what I see. Got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends, burning and bitter mess. You just keep it moving. No. Sing a loud, you save my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. You picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank God. Here's the best part. I have lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Help us another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. Help us another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. Because you pick me up and you turn me around, you place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank God. Are you thankful the Lord has turned you around and Amen. placed your feet on solid ground? We'll praise Him this morning in worship. Church, let's turn around, find someone, shake their hand, give them a fist bump, and welcome them to the service this morning. Glad to see Carmen here. Great. You look like you're smiling in good mood. You may be seated. Thank you. Everybody looks happy. Yay.
give a round of applause for our mom and all the ladies in the church this morning. Walking the talk, walking the talk. Oh, I love that last part. This morning, not only are we celebrating all the ladies of the church, but we're also going to celebrate some who uh, got to choose their favorite song. And we're going to worship and celebrate with them as we sing their favorite song. I wrote down some, uh, some thoughts and about, if I thought about the ladies of the church, here's what I thought of when I, when I was thinking about them. They're a strong foundation. They're the great amen corner. We have some that are the amen corner in the back, in the middle, and in the front. So uh, if a preacher says something great, they say, amen, preach it. So that, that's good. We have a great amen corner. But about the strong foundation, they, don't, they didn't uh, build their house on the sinking sand. They built it on the solid rock of Jesus amen. Christ. Some were board members, tr uh, Chris, uh, children's leaders, quiet, friendly, smiling, supportive, caring, helpful, a chef. I enjoy that. <laughs> Yeah, their food is great. Prayerful, joy and joyful. Worship examples. Strong, strong through physical challenges. Encourager, decorators. Then we know that Diane. So, and she makes sure that we're organized and we're right where we need to be each time. So I'll get to you later, so as by the way. So decorator, organizer, ones that will celebrate with you. They celebrate. They're faithful. They're responsible, they're overcomers, and they're Christ-like. Yeah. We celebrate our moms this morning. Glenna, thank you for being the amen corner in the back. Mm -hmm. So she's a great, friendly person, one that you need to get to meet if you haven't met her yet. Mm -hmm. She's strong in faith and strong in encouragement. She's strong with her smiles and friendly. She's helpful for anyone who needs help. We celebrate you this morning, Glenna, and all the ladies, and we're going to sing her favorite song, And Can It Be. Father's throne above, so free, 
the next one I have to tread lightly. Yikes. I have to watch what I say, right? <laughs> There's a lot of people up there, a lot of boys. There's five of our boys, and one's in heaven. So Robin's been outnumbered all the time. Yeah, that's five boys. And then she became happy, right? We added two, three with Lauren, four with Chanel. So the numbers are coming your way, Robin. We're getting those girls for you. Yeah. Go team. <laughs> really good. Robin has a heart for the church, for God, for you. Some of the, thing, the things that you have today is she loves the craft, loves the craft. And, and boy, when I mentioned chef and food, wow. I'm surprised I'm not 455 pounds. Seriously, she makes the best food she does. and uh, great craft. So the yes. Mother's Day gifts that you'll have today, she made for you. She made for you. So enjoy. Uh, she loves doing that for everyone. I don't know what the men will get, if anything, but, uh, you know, the ladies, she, she just did this for you with her heart for God, her heart for you, her heart for the love of people. And you don't know this part. She loves children. Can you believe that? Bye, boys. She just loves kiddos. Um, she was in charge of vacation Bible school several years. I think we used to run the most. I remember when she was in charge of some, we like over 200, 200 kiddos to Bible school. Whew. A great. Never changed that. If they didn't come, we used to get our van and we'd go get them. We'd go get them. So she loves kids. Here's a song we actually had sung in our wedding. Come thou fount. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy ever ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me song along this sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise thy mount, I fix upon it, mount of thy redeeming
great song. The next lady we asked to give us a song, her favorite song is Myrtle. Myrtle usually sits right here. And Myrtle, I, she was one of those amen corner people I was talking about. Uh, so we're having Glenna hold down the back. So we'll have Myrtle hold down the middle section over here. Right? She's the one that holds down the amen corner right there. I think she's one that helps us show how to worship. Uh, if she agrees with the pastor, she says amen. She loves the song and administers to her heart and says, that's my life. She'll raise her hand. She shows us how commitment to the Lord looks like. How surrender to the Lord looks like. Sometimes we lose that, church. We've lost that. Let's raise our hands and praise the Lord. It's a surrender for His grace and His goodness. Amen. We raise our hands and say, God, you're in charge and not me. Amen. So I appreciate her showing that worship openness and expression of God's love in her life and His grace to her. She's a good example of that. And not just we just lost that at COVID time. I think we lost it before that. Maybe social media or media took over, but I think we should re rewind church a little bit and say, God, you're in charge and not me. We raise our hands and say, amen. Thank you, God, for sending your son and to die for me. And Myrtle, um, she told me this. She led music for 50 years. I think she should take my place. <laughs> 50 years. And she said she sang this song on Mother's Day for 50 years. And she's not here. I'd have her up coming up here to sing it. This is an old song. It's a great song. I remember uh, George Young singing this in the Cathedral Quartet. So we're going to try to sing with you. Sing with me. Will you please on this song? It's entitled Supper Time. It's my life. I'm going to tell you it's my life because at the very beginning it talks about they had to call me home for supper. Because I was across the street playing baseball, basketball, football, you name it. Right, Rich? You probably do the same thing. You had to call me home. Come home. It's dark and I'm still playing baseball. Come home. It's time for supper. Plus, you're going to get in trouble if you don't. So, uh... Come home, come home, it's supper time. The shadows lengthen fast. Come home, come home, it's supper time. Come home. 
It's supper time for Kate, though, Ted. I was just thinking about that. My mind just flipped. She had called home. Come and play in heaven. <laughs> supper time. Well, Diane, I mentioned you already. Diane helps keep us in order, you know. I don't know if you know that or not, but if we're not standing exactly where we need to be or the flower's not in the right spot and needs to be moved left by half of an inch, uh, she'll keep you in line. <laughs> so we need Came back, she came, and Larry came back from Florida, and she, I think she said, you guys need to change those flowers out. <laughs> so, she's really good at keeping us in line and in order, but I'm telling you what, she has a heart for you, heart for God. She'll pray for you. She, she has a heart for people like no one else. You need prayer, Diane will pray for you. You have a need in some way. She's the first to stand in line and say, how can I help? Diane's a giver. She'll give to you. You, do, you may or may not know this, but Diane also sang at Mount Vernon Nazarene University College back then. She sang on one of the traveling groups. So I don't know if you know that or not. She's got a beautiful voice and gave to that ministry and then continues to minister throughout these years. And unfortunately for us, but great for them, down in Winter Haven, they get to see her now for months on end. And she takes her voice and family there and ministers to those in Florida and gets to say hi to some of our friends down there. So we love and appreciate Diane and everything she does for us and how she cares for her church family and God. She is close to the heart of God. So we worship and honor you this morning. Not worship. We honor you this morning, Diane. Let's sing your favorite song. What a day that will be. It goes right along with the song we just sang, Supper Time. What a day. Jesus, I shall see when I look. 
song. What a day that will be. Well, Jenny, I don't see her down here. She must be off doing some important work. She's in the back. And in the past, she's been a children's worker for her, a children's leader. She has a heart for children. And for you as well, and for God and, the, and all the worship experience here, but she really enjoys being with those kids. And that explains Mark. So um, you'll catch that probably sometime next week. And, uh, it'll catch up to you. But uh, well, she has a heart of ministry and a heart for the children, and she loves to smile for them and likes to see the smile on their faces. She has some inspiration for our church and some leadership abilities for our church as well. She's led in different directions of the church and looked at some of our plans and, and brought them to the office and tried to figure out how maybe we could change some things and organize. So not only helps us worship here as adults, but helps the children worship as well. We appreciate her ministry and her love for the church and love for God and all she has done. So, Mark, we miss her here today, but thank goodness she's back doing what she enjoys, being with the children. Her song today is an old song. I love this hymn. And I think it's her life. Under his wings, I am safely abiding. I appreciate that, Rod. Thank you. Some 
more than others, tend to tease her, or they used to tease her. Used to tease her? Because didn't you take like some kind of class where you have a sticks and you were beating on things like this exercise class you had? I think you, I saw a picture of that. I thought you're like, so they don't tease her anymore. <clears throat> so she's learned to use those hitting stability balls or something. It's an exercise thing or something that I don't know. Maybe Mark should stand here. Um, yeah, I'd be safer in the back, back there by gun, so that's probably better. Hey, Tina is, a, oh boy, she is so faithful to sing on the praise team. Amen. I mean, nobody else is going to show up. She will. <laughs> she is so faithful and responsible to be part of the praise team. She loves to sing and minister to you through music. She loves quartet music. Oh, who doesn't? You know? so, <laughs> well, I don't, know. I don't know if that's true, but there's a lot of people who don't, but I do, too. So she loves quartet music and, and Scott Fowler's group, and I think probably you know the Cathedral Quartet. You like their music as well. So uh, Legacy Five is one of her favorites. She has a heart for ministry and a heart for the church. If you want somebody to pray for you, you ask Tina. She'll be the first to stand in line and say, I'll pray for you. I'll stand with you in that prayer need that you have. If you're hurting in some way, I'll help you. I'll give to you. She'll minister to you. She brings us a song that I love. It emphasizes Jesus, Jesus Messiah. Love that song. And church, you've been sitting for a while. Let's stand together as we worship Tina's favorite song, Jesus Messiah. Let's stand and sing. He became sin. Name of 
that have been pretty instrumental in a lot of our lives. Uh, Eileen Perkins, actually Helen, but she didn't go by that name. Um, she was the thumb in my back. She, um, my dad passed away when she was 45 years old. Uh, she still works. She didn't drive a car yet. Didn't have her license. So um, I took, my dad took her to work. My brother took her to work. Then I took her to work when my brother had gotten married and dad was gone, So, but she still worked. She worked her entire life, took six weeks off when she had me and David, my brother, and uh, she, when we got married, she was 54 years old, and I said, Mom, you're going to have to get your license. She did, no problem. Then after that, you couldn't keep her home, so that was a good thing. And then Jane Hammond, what a blessing. She was a great mother-in-law, great mom. And she made a lot of sweets. It's a Hammond thing. They, they, they would eat that over anything else you had to eat. And she was good at it. She did a great job. She loved all of us. She was just a, a woman of God. And I was blessed to have them both in my life. gathered in your house and I confess that I'm so tired the burdens of this life are so heavy on my mind but I don't mean to complain problems cloud my view for you deserve my highest praise 
So, Lord, this is what I'll do. Turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 16, verses uh, 7 through 10, and then verse number 13. We're going to, as you can see from the slide here, what I felt God wanted me to share for the next few minutes here um, as we wrap this service up. Is I want to look at a lady in the Bible um, named Hagar. And maybe you know, heard of her, maybe you haven't, but uh, the more I think about her and study her, the more impressed I am with her and how she and the things she dealt with and how God dealt with her and I think there's a lot we can learn from her story and so we'll fill the backstory in here in a minute but let's go ahead and read the scripture picking up with Genesis chapter 16 verse number 7 <coughs> excuse me the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert it was a spring that was beside the road of Shur and he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, 
Where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. And then down to verse 13. And this is the key verse. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. I like that. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have seen the one who sees me. You know, the Bible's got all kinds of names of God that you could look up. A name such as Elohim, which speaks of the creator God, the almighty God. You have Jehovah or Yahweh, which speaks of the covenant God, the God that's intimate, that knows us, relates to us. El Shaddai, which is another, it means God Almighty, a variation of Elohim. You have Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. And, of course, the name that God gave himself to Moses there at the burning bush, I am that I am, the all-sufficient, ever-present, complete in himself God. And uh, many other names I could mention. And what these names do is they reveal to us who God is because God is of such magnitude. Our human minds can't understand him completely. And certainly one name does not encompass all that he is. And so you can look at these different names and see various facets of who God is and how he relates to us. But it's interesting when you study the names of God. Did you know that the very first name given to God by a human being recorded in scripture is this name that Hagar gives him. And this, her name she gives him is El Roy, that's what it is in the Hebrew, and it means the God who sees. And to understand the significance of that name and why she gave that to him and its meaning for us today, which is ultimately what we want to bring out, we need to know a little bit about Hagar's story. And you can't catch it all just reading verse number 13. And she has a story that leads up to this point. And by the way, may I just interject here, you have a story. You didn't just appear one day here today on, on May 12th in Salina Church of the Nazarene. You have a backstory that has led you to this point in your life. And that story, no doubt, contains pains and hurts and heartaches, disappointments. It probably includes some joys and triumphs and victories. Maybe some, well, I know, I shouldn't say maybe, sheer, uh, shed tears. You've experienced laughter. You have hopes. You have dreams. You have a past. And you have a future where you're headed. You have a story. And what the simple truth I want us to get out of all of this. You have a story, and God sees you. God sees you. So let's look at Hagar's story. Hagar's story, if I could summarize it, was one of victimhood and invisibility. Uh, the Bible, we're introduced to Hagar in uh, chapter 16, and it describes her as an Egyptian maidservant. And those of you who know the story of Abraham, or Abram at this point, his name hadn't changed, you understand that <coughs> he spent a time in Egypt. And why he was there, various things happened. And why he was there, he acquired maidservants and, and, and male servants. And, and so that is probably when Hagar joined his entourage. As a matter of fact, Jewish tradition tells us, uh, this isn't in the Bible, but Jewish tradition says that Hagar was actually one of the daughters of Pharaoh that he gave to Abram. And you say, why would he give his daughter? Well, you got to understand, Pharaoh had a lot of wives, a lot of kids. He wasn't exactly real close to them all. And so they often use children like that uh, in, for political purposes and things of that. And so here is Hagar. She's an Egyptian maidservant to Sarai, which is kind of a nice way of saying that she was her slave. I mean, that's basically what Hagar was. She had no voice in this matter. She was given to Abram and Sarai to be Sarai's slave. And uh, 
as a slave, legally, she had no rights. She had no real future. She had no real power. She had no real voice. She was basically Abram's and Sarai's property to do with as they will. And most of you know the story of Abram and Sarai. Um, they couldn't have children, even though God promised that they would have a child. They were unable to conceive. By now, uh, at this point in the story, Sarai is 76 years old, past childbearing years. Abram's not getting any younger. He's 86. And so Sarai could no longer physically have children. There's no male heir to inherit Abram's estate, which was a huge deal back in that culture. And so something had to be done. God wasn't doing it like he promised, according to them, their thoughts. And so they got to do something. And so Sarai comes up with this plot, and she tells Abram she wants him to be intimate with her maidservant, Hagar. And to be intimate with her, impregnate her with the male heir for the estate. That was their plan. Now, that sounds really weird to us. <laughs> but, once again, you go back to that culture, it was not an uncommon practice. I'm not saying God endorsed it, but that's what people did back then in that situation. And so, that's exactly what happens. Abram is intimate with Hagar so she could bear him a son. And he impregnates her. And Hagar becomes pregnant with Abram's child. Now the point about all this that I want to bring out, Hagar has no say in this. She doesn't, she's not a part of this meeting. She's not a part of this decision. She is absolutely powerless unless she just wants to revolt and, and just run away, which we see she does a little bit later, but she, she has no voice in any of this. She's just going to have to do what she's told. And so Hagar gets pregnant, and immediately Sarai gets jealous because she's able to conceive, which obviously means the problems with Sarai, not with Abram. And so she gets jealous of Hagar. And she, the Bible says she begins to despise her. I mean, it was Sarai's plan. All Hagar did was what she was told, but now she's being despised by the one who she's supposed to be a handmaiden for. And so Sarai goes to Abram and lies about Hagar and says, oh, Hagar is treating me badly now that she has your child. And so Abram just basically says, I don't want to deal with any of this. Do with her whatever you want. She's your handmaid. She's your slave. Don't talk to me about this. He doesn't want to handle it. And so Sarai begins to badly mistreat Hagar. It must have been bad because what happens then is Hagar flees into the desert. Think about that. It's not like she can go to another town. She's running into the wilderness just to get away from Sarai. That's how bad she's being mistreated. She's pregnant and running into the wilderness with no supplies, nowhere to go. She just has to get away. That's how bad things are. And that's where we pick up the scripture. And so think about it. Let's look at Hagar here. Hagar is being used. She is being abused. She has no voice in any of this. She has no say, no rights, no options. She is the epitome of a victim. She didn't cook this scheme up. She didn't ask for it. More than likely, she didn't want it. All of this was forced on her. And now here she is bearing the brunt of it all voiceless powerless invisible and let me ask you have you ever felt like that in your life probably not in the same circumstances but have you ever had something happen to you that is out of your control that you didn't ask for you didn't want you didn't deserve you know sometimes things happen in life and it's because of our own stupid decisions and we can say, boy, I really messed that up and we still don't like it, but we can kind of understand it. But then other things happen where we're not asking. We didn't do anything. And yet it happened. And here we are bearing the brunt of it. Maybe here you are this morning and like Hagar in the desert, 
just facing something and you're feeling, feeling powerless, alone, helpless. But it's at that moment when Hagar comes to the realization, God sees me. God sees me. You see, understanding her backstory, that what she says in verse 13, you are the God who sees me, carries on so much more meaning. No one else is seeing me. I, I had no voice in any of it. I was given to Abram by either my, the Pharaoh or someone in Egypt. I didn't have any voice in that. I was carted over here, put a part of this whole scheme. I had no voice in it all, but now I realize you are the God that sees me. I'm not lost to him. I'm not invisible to him. I'm not worthless to him. My pain, my hurt, my circumstances, God sees me. And I want you to know God sees you. You are not lost to him. He sees your pain. He sees your hurt. He sees your story. He sees where you're at this morning. And not only does God see, but we see that God listens. We read in verse Eight, the latter part, God asked her, what are you doing? Not because God didn't know what she was doing, but because he wanted her to say it. He wanted her to bring her need and burden to him. So not only does God see, God listens. He listens. He wants us to pour out our heart to him. We see it over and over again. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden. I will give you rest. He wants us to ask. He wants us to seek. He wants us to knock. He wants us to cry out to him. He wants to hear about your hurts and your complaints, your fears, your uncertainties, your doubts, your questions, what you're going through. God wants you to talk to him about it because not only does he see, he hears. He listens. It's like Jesus, when he went to his friend Lazarus, who had died, went to the house, and Mary and Martha came to him, and the words out of their mouth were not words of faith, they were words of complaint. Lord, if you were here, he, would, he wouldn't have died. But, but you know what? Jesus listened. He didn't just cut them off, he listened. He wants to listen to you, he wants to hear your cry. So let me ask you, when was the last time you talked to God? about what you're going through. But not only is he the God that sees and hears, he's also the God that, has, that directs. He tells in verse number 9, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Well, that seems kind of harsh, but that's what God had for Hagar at that time. And, and as we see things play out, we understand why. But the point is, God has direction for you. He doesn't just listen like a, sympathetic ear, like you might come to me and, oh, I'm so sorry, I'll pray for you, but you know, I can't, I don't have the wisdom to know what to tell you what to do and this path to take and that sort of thing. He, but God's not like that. He doesn't just listen with a sympathetic ear. He has a path forward for you. He has a way out, a way through, a way to bring healing, a way to bring resolution. That's what he had for Hagar. He listens with the intent to guide. And he guides you to your destiny. And so you have a God that sees you. You have a God that hears you. You have a God that will direct you. But not only does God see, hear, and direct, he also promises. He gives her this great promise, verse 10. I will increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Yes, what God was telling Hagar to do was hard, to go back. But it came with the promise that God would bless her and her offspring. And God's direction always comes with his promises. Let me just remind you of a few of them. He promises never to forsake us. No matter how hard it is, no matter how dark it gets, God is right there. He promised our strength to be made perfect in our weakness. Now that may not mean a whole lot to someone who doesn't need any strength and everything's going fine and dandy, but when you, are, when you feel like you just can't, 
when you feel like you can't face another day and you can't go through another situation. That's when God's strength is there. It's made perfect in your weakness. He gives us, he promises a peace that passes all understanding. Grace that is greater than whatever it is we're facing. Provisions according to his riches and glory. He promised to see us through to one day we stand in glory with him. And many, many other promises I could mention. And so just like Hagar, God sees us. God listens to us. God directs us. And God gives us his promises that are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And this is what Hagar, this powerless, voiceless, invisible woman, discovers in the desert that day that she has a God who sees her. May I remind you in closing, God sees you. When I hear the story of Hagar and think about it, I... I can't help, of course, of being Mother's Day thinking of my own mother. My own mom, in many ways, was like Hagar, especially early in life, powerless, voiceless, just being tossed on the sea of the circumstances of what other people decided to do or not do. She was born into a dysfunctional family. Her mother, natural mother, <coughs> was an alcoholic. There was a death of a brother, an infant. He didn't even leave the hospital, died tragically there. And that, all, that put stress in an already bad, dysfunctional marriage and ended up that her father had an affair and they ended up getting divorced. And she got caught as a young child in this nasty divorce where her father sued for full custody of mom, not because he wanted her, but because he wanted to hurt uh, her mother. And so she got caught up in that. And when she went to live with her dad, when it was all done, he had already married the woman he had the affair with, and she wanted nothing to do with my mom. And so she, my mother, at a young age, five, six years old, ended up in an orphanage because her natural mom was an alcoholic, couldn't take care of her. She ended up in an orphanage and then later in foster care. And even while in foster care, she hooked up with a family that... that loved on her and provided the stability and love she never had from her natural family and they were going to adopt her but then at the last minute they changed their minds and so she had that loss on and on I could go she much like Hagar powerless just a victim of all this stuff but there was a God in heaven that saw her she was not lost to him. And at age 15, I believe it was, she received Christ as her Savior because the Holy Spirit wooed her to himself. And God then began to work in her life, healing all those hurts. Brought, of course, my father into her life. On and on I could go with how God worked. Didn't mean that it wasn't a magic pill. Oh, everything's gone now and better. But that was, he, God set her path to a destiny that brought ultimately healing for all of that. And today, my mother's in heaven with him. What am I telling you? <laughs> all of us have a story. But there's a God in heaven that sees you. And he wants to listen. He wants to guide. And he wants to have you lean on his promises. So I just want to encourage you this Mother's Day. Do that. Carry your burden to him. Let him guide your feet. Lean on his promises. Hagar found it, him to be faithful and true. My mother did, and you will as well. I'm going to ask that we stand as we close. And I wanted to close this service by just praying a special prayer of blessing 
over all the ladies of our church. You mean so much to us. And we take you for granted most of the year. <laughs> but I just want you to know that God sees you. And as we pray this prayer of blessing in closing, I just want to ask that you receive from the Lord what he has for you today. Father, we thank you for our ladies. And they add so much to our lives. And what examples of faith they are. Perseverance. They've been through so much, yet they still worship you again. Their trust, their love, their care, their nurturing, Lord, has enriched our lives in ways we can't even imagine. So, Lord, I pray right now that they would just know that you see them. They are not invisible. They are not lost to you. And sometimes they may be taken for granted. Sometimes they may be victims of certain things beyond their control. But, Lord, you see them. And you have a path forward. You have a destiny for them. And so I pray every woman here, whether they're, they're young, whether they're older... Lord, that they would walk in the destiny you have for them. Because they're turning to you. They're crying to you. They're listening. They're walking as you would have them to. And so, Lord, just bless our ladies. Help them just to sense a special uh, sense of your presence throughout this day. As we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here. You are dismissed. Ladies, please remember to go in the back and uh, we have gifts for you. And uh, thank you again. God bless you.